All right, I am super excited to do some nature journaling with all of you today. And just in case you thought that nature journaling is just making pretty watercolor pictures, then you are wrong. In today's episode of the Nature Journal Show Live Studio Sunday, we're going to nature journal together with some of the most basic nature journaling techniques. And these nature journaling basics are great, even if you've been nature journaling for a while, even if you have a background with painting and making pretty watercolor pictures. What we're going to do right now is going to be fun, exciting. We're going to go on a virtual nature journaling adventure together and cover some of the basics because these basics are actually the most powerful aspect of nature journaling and you can share them with other people in subtle ways. I'll give you a technique for doing that and you can apply these to other aspects of your life in a really life-changing, amazing way. So I've got a couple images here and little videos that we're going to watch together. So get all of your nature journaling stuff, whatever you're using, at the very least a pen and pencil with paper is the most ba basic thing that you would need. I'm just going to say hi to people here in the chat. I see Angie's here. Hi, Angie. Hi, Sabrina. Um, so excited that Sabrina can make it to these Sunday afternoon episodes because it's not too late in Germany. So we're going to start off by looking at some of this stuff and practicing. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So let me just switch to the video here so you can see. Um, and we're going to do some nature journaling from these cool objects I saw recently. Wait, whoops, that's actually my coffee. That's not what we're supposed to be looking at. Let's start with this one here. Um, oops, let me pause that. So get your paper ready. Um, get your paper and your nature journaling stuff ready. Let me make my coffee disappear because um, I don't think that's what we want to be looking at. Um, here we go here. Okay, so whoops yeah there we go all right so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do i notice i wonder it reminds me of actually maybe i'll put my um maybe i will use my document camera so the first is i notice and it's really easy with i notice to forget um what that means but what we're gonna do is we're just gonna focus on observations so some of you might already be thinking about what this thing is and yes, some of you did see it on Instagram, so there might be some information for my Instagram um, that you already know about this thing. But when we do, I notice in our nature journals, it's not about what we know, it's about what we notice, what we observe directly. So I'm gonna write that down on my paper for those of you who aren't familiar with I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Um, it's, it's the most basic nature journaling technique. So let me switch back to my coffee camera um, over here and move my coffee out of the way and put my nature journal in here. So this is the most basic and most powerful nature journaling technique that there is. And you can use drawings for it, but um, you can also just use words. So this is basically, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me. And I've chosen these videos specifically to share some fun to look at stuff, but also some stuff that's going to be really good for this exercise. So what I often do is just use colons and then make a list under these. And I don't necessarily use complete sentences. So um, for an I notice, an example would be, um, something really basic about the shapes that I see. So not bringing in my outside information about this object that I'm looking at um, and pretending like I'm an alien even and just seeing um, basic things. So what I'm my first observation that I notice is that the long skinny things are green. Um, I'm just going to write skinny green things. And then I notice that the background is pink and purple. So background, pink, purple. So all I'm doing is noticing my observation. My observation is just um, that I'm noticing this color distinction between the shapes there. So take a moment right now, if you haven't already, and let's write down um, like at least five things that we notice about what we're looking at. And I'll just play 
um, the video a couple times um, while you write down things that you notice. So what I'm saying is things that you notice are not like, I notice a blah, blah, blah species of um, something, something. So you're not bringing in your knowledge about plants or animals or anything like that. You're just making observations about what you see or notice through your senses. So a couple more examples of things you can notice. You can notice quantities. So um, what here can you notice regarding quantities? Quantities, colors, shapes, patterns, etc. Also, since this is a video, what does that mean that since it's a video, what can you notice as well? In a video, what do you what is possible to notice that is not noticeable in a still photograph? So in a second, we're going to get into I wonder where we ask questions, but don't start asking questions yet. So it's okay if you're struggling with this part and you're finding, um, oh, I might have to refill my food aid demo in, but I don't think I'm going to do that right now on video. Uh, so it might be a little bit challenging for you to do this exercise and that is totally normal um, because we do skip to our interpretations and i'm just going to share sabrina's comment here or experience um, of, a, of a teacher um, that was really strict about making a distinction between description and interpretation and this is super important and this can apply to all aspects of your life this can apply to your relationships with other people and i know that when we're uh having like a strong thought or a strong feeling it can be hard to slow down this much and separate our interpretation from our description that's why nature journaling is a great way to practice doing this thanks for sharing that sabrina oh and hi rose is joining from arizona welcome rose i noticed an interesting looking flower on rose's um, little image there. Okay, I think it's a flower. All right, so I'm going to give a couple tips for this this technique here. Um, I'll zoom in my document camera a little bit more to help. Um, maybe you can see my notes, but if you can't, that's fine. So here are a couple things. Here are a couple tips. Right here, you can see the words um, skinny, skinny, and green. Uh, so both of those words are pure descriptive words. So colors and shapes are always a pretty objective description. Um, and I'm also just calling them skinny green things instead of leaves, petals, flowers, feet, legs, eyeballs, scales, you know, all of these words that have specific meanings. I'm just trying to describe the shape and maybe even coming up with a name of my own. Background pink and purple. So also noticing um, the colors and a distinction between two parts with that have two different colors. Um, movement of spines. So here's a tip right here. I put spines inside of apostrophes, I mean quotation marks. So by using quotation marks, you're keeping it um, you're you're keeping it in as simple and not putting in an interpretation. Um, little round things, seems wet. This is another word trick that you can use to keep your um, descriptions from being interpretations is I don't know if this thing is wet, but my, the visual information that I'm getting makes it seem like it's wet. I could probably break that down even more and say there's an interesting reflection um, and a smoothness to some parts of it. So the trippy thing about this to think about is that we assume things are wet, for example, from some type of visual information that we're getting. And we're not even necessarily aware of what those visual observations are that lead us to know it's wet. But in some cases, those visual information, those could be um, 
leading us to the wrong interpretation and uh we we might not know how to get out of it if we don't know how to break things down this way so i know it seems sort of uh, repetitive and stuff like that and slow but this is a really important nature journaling basic um, and then i noticed the darker red bump in the middle so if anybody wants to share any of the things that they noticed go ahead and type those into the comments um, and we will get ready for um, doing I wonder. I'll play this again. Oh, and obviously um, movement is the thing that you can notice when you're looking at a video that you can't notice when you're looking at a photo. That's one of the main, main differences actually. Okay, so one really fun strategy is to use your things that you notice and observe and translate those directly into questions. So an example of that would be skinny green things. I saw skinny green things. So my question, something that I wonder is, um, what are the skinny green things? That is a really basic question, but a lot of times that first um, question leads you to better questions. Ooh, ooh, lots of really great observations from Rose, um, Sabrina and Cindy. Thanks for sharing those. Great observations. So let's start working on questions. My first one is, what are the skinny green things? And that one came directly from one of the things that I noticed. However, I don't think this is a very good question. It, it's kind of generic and um, maybe it's not that interesting of a question. However, just writing it down can often lead to uh, more interesting questions. So for example, what are the skinny green things? Um, and then I could ask, so going in a form function direction, I could ask, what do they do? What function do they have? And so here's, a, here's another pro trick. Um, instead of writing out a really long sentence, I could just write this, function, question mark or and then or I could write green spikes function so practicing how to write these questions in um, a shorthand type way can be really useful especially when you're in the field and you're actually looking at an an, an organism like this while waves are crashing next to you so what I often like to do is after doing this observation and pretending like I am an alien observer during this part um, when I get to the question asking, I start to be okay with having some assumptions. So right now, let's all, um, ooh, that's a really cool question, Angie. Um, right now, let's all assume that this is a living thing, um, either a plant or an animal probably. It's not microscopic, I'll give you that hint since there's no scale here. This is not a microscopic organism, but it is a living organism. So now let's take a couple minutes here to write down some questions that we have about this thing. So let's go ahead and write some questions on our own.
All right, let's take a couple more minutes here to try to come up with some questions. Great questions, Angie. And um, I like, yeah, great questions from Angie. Go ahead, if you have um, some questions that you just wrote down, go ahead and share those in the chat. And there's a couple ways that you can do this in the field. So um, if you're nature journaling in the field, I'm gonna switch to my other camera. If you're nature journaling in the field, you can actually do this verbally. You can do this type of nature journaling without a nature journal. And I know that seems crazy to a lot of people because the word nature journal is built into what we do. The word journal is built in there. However, a lot of what we do, the majority of what we do is a perspective. It's a way of thinking and it's a way of looking at the world. It's not a way of drawing pictures. Drawing pictures is just part of it but it's a way of thinking and looking. So I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of, can be done spoken out loud. And this is really cool for a variety of reasons. If you're with a little kid and drawing and writing is not something that they feel comfortable with, then you can do, I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of, with them. And you can make this happen in a really short amount of time. In even a 30 second interaction with a kid or another person, you could use these prompts instead of just talking the way that we normally do. So you could ask someone what they notice um, and then you could just share a question. Like if you're looking at this, this organism that we're looking at right now and um, you're standing there with a little kid, in, a, in our society today, the, what the majority of adults would do is they would start reciting facts or supposed information about what they think this organism is to the kid. Um, or to the other person, to the other adult. And that those facts might be, are as likely to be wrong as to be correct. And they're not really that interesting. However, um, and they're also not, they don't belong to that person. But when you look at this organism right here and you make a direct observation about what you see, feel, hear, taste, or smell, then that is something that you own that is completely valid because it's based on your sensory observation. I can't even compare directly to your sensory observation. So each person has a valuable thing that they can contribute there. And then the questions are also so much more interesting because those also belong to you and they also can lead to more conversation and they keep your mind open as opposed to if I um, am in sort of the traditional mindset, I would just tell a person next to me, that's a sea urchin. And then I would just start saying all these things about sea urchins that I had read or remembered someone else saying. Some of that information probably would be untrue. It might not be pertinent to the situation. Um, and it might limit us from seeing new things. Um, and it might also make it so that everybody else that I was with um, wouldn't feel like they could make valid observations and questions themselves. So in a sort of nature hike with an expert leading it, that is very likely to happen. Um, so I see some great questions, really, really cool questions. Um, and um, Angie has shared some and um, Rose sh shared a really cool one too. Um, I like that. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple um, of my um, sort of little tips and stuff here for this technique. And I'll, I'll just hold my, my journal up. So under I, under I wonder, I'll, I'll read these out loud to you. Under I wonder, one of the things that I asked was based on my I notice. Um, so I said uh, skinny green things. Actually, I'm going to switch to the other camera because I'm sure this is like really, really small. And there might be a way for me to, um, that, that'll be fine. Okay, so um, skinny green things. What are the skinny green things? Not the greatest question, but that led to what do they do? what function, so function is an important category of questions. Um, then I skip to another one, what makes the colors? So that one is based on my observations about the colors. So what makes the colors? Um, and then I also asked, and this is sort of an example of an outside of the box question, what is the sound? Because this video has sound also, 
This might not be related to the sea urchin, but sometimes asking those sort of weird questions or seemingly unrelated questions, you have those popping up in your mind and um, you might have kind of eliminated them or stopped listening to them since you became an adult. But this is why kids ask questions like that. And if you're in a group of people, someone might ask a weird question like that and those can be super useful. So this question might not be useful now, it might be unrelated, it might seem unfocused or distracted or silly. What is the sound? Um, however, sometimes uh, those are the questions that need to be asked. So if those come up for you while you're doing I Wonder, write them down. Also, what is it made from? So that's similar to what makes the colors, that's what I would call a composition or ingredients. What are the ingredients in this thing? How does it move? Um, what, how much energy does it take to move? What does it eat? Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple tips about question asking on the document camera over here um, because question asking is so, so important. Um, great, great questions. And so here's another, I'm gonna highlight this one. Um, Sabrina asks, and this is what I would call in my taxonomy of questions, uh, Sabrina's calling it a very basic question, and I, I call this like a, a, a silly question. So uh, it's something that a lot of us might take for granted, and that just means that if you are wrong, you are very, very wrong. So every once in a while asking sort of a question that's sort of either uh, questioning your assumptions. So if we're assuming this is an animal um, and we never question that assumption, that could be problematic. Um, and especially when you're in the ocean, because sometimes it's surprising in the ocean, what are plants and what are animals? And uh, so questioning these assumptions or asking these some, somewhat seemingly silly questions is super useful. Um, so I did a whole video about taxonomy of questions and I'm not gonna get into that one too much right now, um, but there's a whole nother video about this and it's called taxonomy of questions that you can search for and it talks about all the question types but let's keep going with the practice because that's what i wanted to do today mostly and that is the most fun part so we'll just quickly go over it reminds me of um it reminds me of is really important even though i usually make it a lot shorter but it reminds me of this is the place where you can bring in your outside information so i know i already dropped the word sea urchin but now would be a time if you have any um it, information that you've read or seen other places or learned about um, through reading or watching videos, this is where you can bring it into that it reminds me of. And you can also um, bring in really funny things. So this is really good for your brain because it connects um, to more parts of your brain. Anytime something is connected to more parts of your brain, it makes it harder for you to forget and practicing making associations between distant ideas in your brain is one of the, uh, the things that is um, just really good for exercising your brain. And a lot of times the ability to connect distant ideas is a definition of intelligence. So practicing it even when they seem like really distant connections is actually very useful. I particularly like um, connecting things to uh, familiar, really familiar objects um, so like what Angie did that it reminds of a hairbrush. And then another one is um, connecting to food items. So let's take a moment and write down the things um, it reminds you of. And I'm kind of getting distracted because I'm looking at all the good ones in the chat um, before I actually write any of my own. But I'm going to take a, a second to just write down some of my own. So let's all write down things and let's see how many we can come up with of it reminds me of. So one other thing I'm going to point out before I, um, uh, but briefly so that I don't go into like a whole long thing about this because it's actually really interesting is the, it reminds me of 
is also an opportunity to um, under, try to understand principles in nature. So for example, if it reminds you of chicken feathers, as someone pin, moi, uh, mentioned, or pine needles, um, or a holiday tree, um, though, if, if those are other things in nature that have a similar pattern in some way, you might ask questions. Why are they similar? Is there a reason why they might be similar? Is there a possibility that they are performing a similar function? Is there a possibility that they are somehow genetically closely related? So they have a lineage together that might cause them to have a similar shape. So this organism actually does have some of those similarities. Um, and so that can be a really interesting way to learn about nature. And then another uh, really, really important one is if you, um, is to think about human made objects and how this could be similar. So if it reminds you of a hairbrush um, or if it reminds you of some other type of thing, this is the, the place where biomimicry can come into human design. And I think it's really important that everybody who's making things um, making hum human made objects, whether it's, you know, cups or pencils um, or robots or artificial intelligence or farm farmland or whatever, anybody who's designing those kinds of things, if they're looking at patterns in nature and learning from the things that nature is doing and trying to apply them to human design, it can only make their designs a lot better. And unfortunately, there's not, not enough of that. And of course, people have been doing it for thousands of years, but we need more of that. Um, okay, okay, we're gonna go to the next thing and we're gonna go um, a little bit quicker through that it reminds me of. Some of you, while I've been talking, might have been doodling this and that would be a really great idea um, to at least um, doodle diagram. If you saw that class at Wild Wonder, at the very least, you could do a quick sketch or write down something about what you see if you're not as comfortable with sketching. But I'll just show you how basic um, this could be just so I remember that I was looking. And it could even be cartoony, which is kind of what I'm gonna go for now, which is more symbols. But I am gonna try to at least get this idea that they're going sometimes in different directions. Um, and then maybe I'll just kind of do an imaginary kind of uh, noticing how it has this central thing. And of course, there's so many spines you could easily spin forever, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. Oh, maybe I'll just use um, like a single line for the spines. That would be better. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use arrows. Someone I think said dark orb or sucker. I'm going to just say dark orb in uh, quotation marks. And then I'm going to say like red, reddish. I'm going to switch these two so you can see this bigger. Um, so you can see how simple I'm going for a very, very basic um, graphic depiction of this um, just to go along with my questions. Um, and then I'm going to write urchin really big. So you can see how simple it can be to connect a little bit of the visual information to your, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of without getting intimidated by the drawing part because a sea urchin is not gonna be an easy thing to draw and just freaking out about the drawing could be the thing that prevents you from nature journaling at all. Um, but look at how simple that was, uh, just a little bit of, um, this is the real powerful nature journaling basics. So if you're just skipping to the drawing stage and really focused on the visual representation of that, of course, drawing is fun, don't get me wrong. I could spend five hours trying to paint this with watercolor and go in there with highlights with my gel pen or gouache and that's beautiful, I'm not knocking that, but nature journaling has a lot of powerful tools besides that. Um, and the drawing part can actually turn people off or make people feel like they're not good at doing this or anything like that. Um, wow, so many good things that uh, people are noticing and asking questions about and so many it reminds me of. Um, this is awesome. And we're gonna go to the next thing. So we're gonna switch it up um, quite a bit here in the next video. So um, get ready for this one. Because one thing that a lot of people do in the nature journaling community is we just focus on plants and animals. And nature is more than just plants and animals. Nature is also a lot of abiotic processes. 
So there's biotic things, living things such as plants, animals, all the microscopic things that are alive. Um, but there's also abiotic things in nature. And so many people don't nature journal that. So fire is an example of something abiotic. And of course, there's an intersection between abiotic and biotic things in nature. So let's go ahead and start a new one um, and start writing down some things that you notice about this. What do you notice? And remember, let's start our I notice as aliens and pretend like we know nothing about um, any of the things that happen on Earth. So just focus on what you notice. What do you see? Um, try not to even use the word um, F-I-R-E. What do you see? Like, what are the color differences that you see, the patterns that you see, and the movement that you see without bringing in your outside um, knowledge or interpretations? The video seems to be pausing a little bit. Oh. Okay. There we go. So this might be difficult because you really want to bring in your knowledge about this phenomenon. Um, but let's pretend like we did just come from an alien planet and we don't know anything about uh, processes on Earth and we don't know about this, um, this red, uh, orange uh, moving thing. There's a, a red, orange moving thing um, that we're looking at and uh, we don't know anything about it yet. So what as aliens can we notice? What do we observe? Go ahead and write a few things down and they can be really simple. One thing might be, I noticed these uh, lines going up and down. These, some of them are darker and some of them are lighter. Okay, good job, everybody. Uh, I know that this is especially hard with the fire. I've never done, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of with fire before, but I think it's really interesting to, um, to see how our um, visual observations, our direct observations are so quickly turned into um, interpretations. And a lot of times our interpretations are correct. You know, if you saw this, your brain does not need to stop and think about what visual information tells you it's fire because it immediately knows it's fire and our brain is it, it's important for our brain to be able to jump to that conclusion really quickly however when we're nature journaling being able to slow things down is actually really important because we realize that we don't understand things so for example if you came from another planet and you had to um, figure out if this was an animal or not how would you know that what were this orange stuff is not an animal? Okay. How would how would an alien know that that orange stuff is not an animal? So go ahead and post in the chat um, or just write that question down and maybe think about it for a little bit. And if you have an answer to that question, you think or a, another question, post it in the chat. How would I know? This is not an animal. So that is probably, you know, that would fit under I wonder. And I would consider that sort of a philosophical question 
or a silly question going back it's it's sort of an a question of an assumption sort of like sabrina asking if that sea urchin was an animal right so um what what information do i have that tells me this is not an animal if that question comes up in your i wonder that would be a really thought-provoking question um i'm also noticing you know and and that can be jumping around so it's it's very common when we do i notice i wonder it reminds me of in our nature journals to jump around from one to the other so for example cindy um had this which is basically um going quickly from an I notice to an it reminds me of. So it reminds Cindy of a footprint, which is really cool. Um, it reminds me of, but this is also just an example of how we can jump around when we're doing I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And um, that is something that uh, she was reminded of. And if, if when I'm looking at it now, I see it looks like there's multiple footprints. So that's an it reminds me of combined with an I notice. Um, Angie's also pointing out this sort of uh, sensory bias that we have as nature journalers, especially when we're doing video, because right now all you can do is visually perceive and auditorially perceive. Um, you cannot experience the smell, the uh, touch, um, or the taste of, of this situation. Uh, but if you were there in person, you could. However, in nature journaling, we still rely really heavily on visual with a teeny bit of auditory stuff um, built into it. And this is something Kate Rudder did a whole class about at Wild Wonder. So a lot of times the visual and the auditory or all the time are getting overrepresented in our nature journaling. So good point, Angie. Thanks for pointing that out. So let's go ahead and jump into questions, um, question asking about what we see. So I'm gonna switch my camera here. Um, start writing down some questions you have about what you see. And let's all assume that we know that this is fire now. We don't have to pretend to be aliens. We know that this is fire. What are some questions that we can ask about it? Let's go ahead and take a few minutes here. Let's take a few minutes and ask, um, write down some of our questions. So I encourage you, if you've gotten to a place um, where you you aren't coming up with any more questions, ask some silly questions. So sort of like the one that I asked about, how would I know that this is not an animal? Try asking some other questions such as, why is it black in the middle? What is smoke? Even the question, what is smoke? Think about some of the questions that little kids would ask that we don't ask anymore. Um, because we think we know the answer. Do, do I really understand what smoke is, how smoke works, what smoke is made of? Um, does that, does my knowing about smoke prevent me from asking some really interesting questions about it? Is all smoke different? Does steam look the same as smoke? Why is the word for steam and the word for smoke the same in some languages? Is there, is it possible for smoke and steam to be mixed together? So that is just one part, um, uh, one, one way to kind of ask a whole bunch of questions around something that I might normally take for granted. Very cool, very, very cool questions. I love the, I love the, what people are um, coming up with today. I'm trying to keep on top of all the stuff in the chat, but some really great stuff. If for all of you who watch this as the recorded version, um, post your own observations and questions 
into the YouTube comments or the Facebook comments um, if you're not here for the live chat. Great. Okay. So let's quickly do it reminds me of before we go to the next video. And if you want, if you haven't done this already, maybe draw some um, diagrams of what you see. So I'm actually going to do a funny diagram. And this is guaranteed to help me remember um, this better. Just one diagram. Look how quick that was. That sort of captures that idea of it looking like a footprint. And then a little bit of you know, I'm not even being very observant, but more symbolic with my my drawings here. Um, and then I'm going to draw a couple um, cartoony trees. And maybe an arrow showing movement. So look how easy with that very simple diagram, I captured some information about it. And now I'm going to go to It Reminds Me Of. Well, it actually reminds me of a video that I did on the Nature Journal show a couple weeks ago about nature journaling prescribed fire that uh, you could watch where I'm nature journaling at this prescribed fire that you see here. Um, I'm going to write footprints, even though that wasn't originally my idea. Um, I'll play it again so you can get some of the sound in there. Okay, so if you haven't already, put down some food related thing that it reminds me reminds you of whenever you connect something to food, it helps your memory a lot and it makes the learning more fun. So write down one last reminds me of about food and then we're going to go to the next thing. All right, hurry up and write one food item that it reminds you of the sillier, the better. Did you know that the Greeks and Romans were masters of memory and they would memorize like hour long speeches, um, meticulously memorized. And one of the strategies they used um, was to associate things with absurd things. So if you needed to remember a specific phrase or a specific reference or whatever, a specific name, to associate that with something absurd, um, sometimes sexual or just absurd and weird or food related, then it would be easier to remember. So um, good job everybody doing that and practicing your brain that way. Okay, now we're gonna go to another one. Whoa. All right, so let's start with I notice. Um, go ahead and write these into your nature journal. What do you notice? I'm gonna pretend like I'm nature journaling outside of the ocean. Ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Yay, thanks, Sabrina. Good to see you. Bye, Sabrina. I'm going to leave it here for a second so you can ask some more, uh, put down some more things that you notice.
Remember, the things that you notice are really basic observations and we're pretending like we're aliens. So what are the colors that you see? You don't know anything uh, or have any idea of what this might be. Um, it, could be a, it could be a mineral, it could be a crystal, um, it could be um, non-living, it could be living, um, it could be a lot of different things. You don't know anything about it. It could be really big, it could be really small. So what do you just see visually um, or here, in this case, we don't have the sound, but what are the things that you see, relationships between colors, different shapes, different patterns? And uh, one of the things we were uh, noticing with the previous one was moisture. And so um, Angie just pointed that out and let's get, let's get in depth into this one too. So how do we know this isn't, this, this is moisture? Like what are, what is our visual? Because that's one that I wrote down too, is that it's wet and that the things in the background are wet too. Um, but how do we know, like, what is the visual information? Cause we're not touching it, right? Um, touching us, touching something is another way that we decide whether it's moisture. And that one can be um, tricky too. If you've ever um, been walking on a carpet at home before and stepped on a, a dime or a penny or another coin that is on the carpet, you might have had the experience where you think you're stepping on something wet, a wet spot in the carpet. But when it, when it actually all it is, is a little piece of metal on the carpet. And that piece of metal is such a different texture and is is warm, I mean, cold compared to the carpet that it feels like something is wet. So like when we look at this and we're just looking at it visually, um, how, how can we know it's wet? Because if you've seen paintings before, like oil paintings, for example, they can make something um, look wet. And in fact, touch your screen right now. Your screen is not wet, but it looks wet. You're not even really looking at a wet thing you're looking at lights on a screen so they're not wet so that's really interesting to think about when we're doing i notice in our nature journals is um we're we're trying to see what our most basic observations are so what is the observation maybe it's something about those little highlights so do you see those little white highlights does that make it look wet so i notice little white lines and maybe that's something you didn't notice visually before because you're automatically interpreting it as, as um, wetness. So let's look at those, those things that are telling us that it is wet and see if we can describe them in words. I tried one, um, you, can, you can use the same one because I think I took the really good one, but I notice these white lines, these white lines that look like reflections on moisture. I notice these white lines uh, in between the, the circles. Cindy, yeah, the gleam, exactly, the gleam. So that's a really, yeah, the gleam seems to be a huge way that our brain interprets something as moisture. And that can be simulated. Um, there's like those fake food things that they do, that they make something look like it has a gleam to it. Um, the, the computer screen is obviously doing it with light, um, focus on getting that light right. So um, as an artist, that's also really important to be able to, to figure that out. And, and I'm sure all of you are looking at the highlights on this um, this or, this uh, orange purple background in a totally different way now. Um, so thanks for bearing with me as I, I really pushed us to kind of question what moisture looks like. Now let's skip into um, so great observations, um, great observations, everybody. Let's skip to I wonder what are some questions, and we'll just jump in now and and uh, assume that this is uh, probably a living thing. It could be a mineral. Sometimes mineral self-organizes into to patterns. Uh, Non-living things can have a lot of pattern to them, but I think we're going to assume this is living and ask some questions about it. So go ahead and write down some questions. And remember, if your first question is, I wonder what it is, um, who it is, all of those are fine. 
and just write that down, write that question down. And that question hopefully will lead you to a more interesting question. And I'll switch to my uh, other camera. So, ooh, wow, I'm already seeing some great questions. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm gonna steal some of Angie's questions. Uh, I wonder which end is up. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna question the question. So this is always a good strategy. What does that even mean? Do all animals or plants have an up, a top? So here's another um, pro tip. Oh my gosh, Angie, you're killing me. Uh, another pro tip here. Oops. Um, pro tip here is these three words here, if at all. So if I ask a question like, um, uh, does, it, does it swim? Or no, no, actually, that's not the right question. The question would be something like, how, how does it move? There is an assumption built into this question. Um, the assumption built into this question is that it does move. So then I just add this, if at all. And sometimes you notice that once you're partway through the question. So for example, um, I might ask, what does it eat? How often does it eat? What kind of plants does it eat? Each one of those questions has assumptions um, built into it that we can sometimes just write if at all, if any, as a way to uh, recognize that we have an assumption um, built into there. Another one um, that is a really common question with, with things like this are why questions, and we can't always answer why questions um, so, for example, um, we might ask the question, uh, why does it have, uh, why are there round dots? So Rose just asked this question. Great question. And this is probably um, one of the first questions that will come uh, to, your, to, to our minds, almost on the same level as what is it um, or, you know, what kind of animal is it? So great question. And those questions often lead us to other questions. So... Um, Let's take a minute right now to build off of Rose's question. Um, and, and some of our questions might already build off of it, but let's ask some questions, other questions related to um, Rose's question. Whether that is, uh, we could question uh, any assumptions that are built into the question. We could also use that question to guide us to other more specific questions or other related questions. So let's see. Um, what questions we can come up with related to that one. Or even rephrasing the question. Uh, what would be another way to, to, to rephrase that same why question? 
And I'll give you a little hint. It comes back to this word right here. Because that's why are there or um, what do those do? Those are often these function related questions. Oh, I know I have a good one. Um, Um, So some of the questions that I, I came up with based on Rose's question is, um, what makes the color white? Do they see the color white? So does this animal, if this is an animal, see the color white? What chemicals make white? Um, I could think of so many more questions related to that white now. Um, so I'm really glad. Um, oh, Cindy asked a great one. And that's something I was totally taking for granted. So questioning an assumption Oh yeah, I love that. Um, are they just attaching to it? What if these were a totally different organism or like a mold or a parasite attached to the underneath thing and we just assumed they were part of the same thing? Great question, Cindy. Oh, Angie has to go. All right, Angie, thanks for joining in. See you later. Bye. Um, Great question, Cindy. Oh, I love that. Okay, let's go to It Reminds Me Of on this one. And we're gonna, I'm gonna try to talk less for the next few and just let us nature journal them because I still have a couple more videos. Um, and uh, so let's go into It Reminds Me Of on this one. So what does it remind me remind me of? And you can say it reminds you of a sea star or a starfish or a whatever you think that it is. Ooh, moss spores. Hi, Valerie, that is a great one. So now would also be the time if you want to do any quick sketches of any part of this on the doodle diagram kind of end of the spectrum, go ahead and do that. I think it's really liberating to to figure out how to um, do these really quick things where it's just your drawing is a note also your drawing works as as a note and just having these simple drawings um, for uh, the sea urchin back here the the fire here and the um, the little bit of this is a sea star by the way oh a slime mold great one Oh yeah, sprinkles. I totally, I think that's the vibe that I was getting, Rose. Um, very cool. Okay, great. So we're gonna go on to the next thing. Oh yeah. Um, if your volume's on really high, you might wanna turn it down now because the next one might be kind of loud. Oh, hi, Jean. Jean just got here. So we're doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, looking at these different videos. So um, get your paper ready. And what I'm doing is just these columns, but you can do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of however you like. Um, I'm doing columns for right now and we're looking at different things and starting with 
I notice. And when we start with the I notice, we're pretending like we're aliens and we don't know anything about any of what we're looking at. So let's just pretend we don't know what's making that buzzing sound. We don't really understand this purple thing um, that it, you know, what it is. We can just focus on our observations and what we perceive. So some of that is coming from sound because we do have sound, but mostly it's coming from visual. So what are the things that we can see right now um, and count that aren't, that are just perceptions and they're not interpretations of what we see. So I'll go first. And I notice a lot of these little sort of uh, whitish pale things that are sort of longer than they are wide. And they're all kind of pointing um, in slightly different directions. Some are sort of pointing in the same direction. So go ahead and write down things that you notice um, about this. And I'll play the video again so that you'll be able to notice video type thing. So remember, you don't know anything about planet Earth. You're an alien. You don't know about plants or animals. It could be really simple. I notice movement. I notice different colors. I notice a round thing. I notice a shaking movement. Round thing in the middle. What, what about colors? What do you notice with colors? And I try to write these in incomplete sentences in whatever way I can write them um, the fastest. So I write lots of purple instead of writing out, I notice lots of purple. It's mostly darker in the middle, but then there's these light, light things of different shape. So everybody probably wants to say something they notice about bees or about plants or about flowers or about pollen. Um, and what I want to point out is that those are great. And those are our brain jumping to conclusions because first our brain needs to bring in visual or other types of sensory information and then convert those into ideas. And so we often are correct when we jump to conclusions. But what if I said, for example, um, those, um, I notice bees pollinating the flower. I notice bees pollinating the flower. Is that a real, is that something that I'm noticing? Actually, that is a complex interpretation based on a bunch of different visual information. So if I said, I notice the bees are pollinating the flower, that would not be a direct observation. Um, and it would be um, potentially incorrect and could lead to a lot of stories and misinterpretations about what's happening or even explanations to other people about what's happening. And that is um, problematic. So if instead I focus on um, a building up from my direct observations, I notice, then asking questions um, like not, for example, not taking things for granted. So in the last two um, or three, people asked, is this an animal or is this a, is this a plant? Um, as if we didn't assume those things. So right now, the thing I want us to practice questioning the assumption of is uh, bees and pollination, because this is something, if you look into it more, it's actually way more complicated than people think. So yes, there are um, these little separate looking organisms entering into this flower. And yes, flowers are a reproductive part. Those are all, that's all outside information we're bringing in. That's different from I notice. Um, however, just because 
uh, an, an insect is inside of a flower doesn't mean it's pollinating it. So I'll let you all think about that a little more. If you want to do research on the side about that, um, I highly recommend it. But for right now, we're going to just write down a couple more things that we notice and then go on to the next stage. If you have any things that you notice, um, post them in the comments. What do you notice? Um, and remember, you don't know about bees, you don't know about plants, you don't know any of that. What are some uh, visual things you notice? For example, have you counted anything? I'm gonna do some counting. Okay, that's something that I, I notice. I don't recommend trying to count all of those other sort of skinny white things that might take forever, but what are some other things in here that you could count? And what are some things that um, are giving you the visual information that those are um, bees? Like how do you, what is the visual information you're getting that distinguishes that from the rest? That might be hard for us to um, dissect, but remember your brain is making those, is, is, is picking up on little bits of perceptual information and turning it into interpretations. Also important to remember, there are many organisms in nature that look like bees or look like flowers that are not, that are fakes. And if your, um, if your I notice um, is unconscious um, and you don't realize what your brain is using to build an interpretation of something being a bee, you could easily be fooled. So for example, many people in their brains just have the idea that a bee is a certain color, it has wings, and it has darker stripes on it. And then there's a whole bunch of other insects that just copy those things, but they don't copy all of the other details of the bee. And um, people see them um, and automatically assume that it's a bee. And you could be nature journaling about these things and writing down it's a bee when in fact it's a fake bee. It's one of these other insects that pretends to be a bee. So this is showing you why I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of is super powerful. And the fact that um, there's not that many people watching this live video might be because this part of nature journaling seems less exciting and less sexy than watercolor painting a beautiful poppy flower with bees inside of it. But this I notice, I wonder it reminds me of is really applicable to other aspects of your life. And I think it's one of the most powerful parts about nature journaling. And we can do it even we, when we don't have a nature journal, we can do it out loud in our head. Um, and spoken to other people. So I like doing it with kids, even before they're ready to read or write, we could ask them, um, instead of me saying, look kids, those bees are pollinating that flower. And all the kids just look up at me and assume that I'm speaking the truth. Instead, I could say, what do you see? What do you notice? Um, what, what, what are some of the colors that you see? What are some of the shapes that you see? And then we could ask questions together. Like the kid might ask, what are the bees doing? Instead of assuming that I know, I might be at a, I might even answer, I don't know. What do you notice is happening? Are they moving? You can just sort of, instead of just providing uh, an easy answer that might be uh, untrue, you can kind of go with things a little bit more. So now we're going to go into the I wonder section. So this is probably the, the um, one of the most fun part. Ooh, yeah. So Rose um, counted a similar thing to me. Um, Valerie did a great job of uh, estimating the, the little white things, um, really cool. And then Valerie is, is, is saying that it seems like the um, insects are looking for things. And I love the word seem um, in that instance and using that word um, or using um, parentheses or quotation marks around things can be a really good way of making a distinction between our observations um, and our interpretation. So um, good job there. So I'm gonna play the video again and let's write down our questions. Your questions can come directly from your observations or they can come from other places also. So one of my observations was round thing in middle. 
simple question coming from that would be, what is the round thing? Very basic and not very interesting question. A more interesting question might be, does the round thing have a function? A more weird question might be, does anything eat the round thing? So let's just take a moment here for everybody to come up with some of their own questions um, or, or do a simple drawing if you want. I'm going to ask a meta question. So like a perspective question, how do I know what bees look like? If you haven't already, I highly recommend, um, I highly recommend you watch my video called a taxonomy of questions where I talk about all different types of questions and how to come up with them. Ooh, I like Valerie's or does the round thing eat anything? Sometimes those, what seem like silly questions can actually be really, really good. So I'll give an example of a silly question. Um, how does it go? What would happen if I rode on a beam of light? What would happen if I rode on top of a beam of light. So that question sounds like the kind of thing a little kid would ask while lying outside in the sun um, and eating an ice cream and uh, sort of just mind wandering or uh, something like that. But that was actually a question asked by Albert Einstein. And that question, um, silly sounding question, led to his theory of, I think it was, special relativity, no, general relativity. And so these silly questions, um, you might not discover, uh, you know, uh, special or general relativity like Einstein, but you might come up with some interesting questions that help you see the world in a new way and contribute um, in, on some level. So uh, these silly questions sometimes are actually like lead to really important things. Ooh, and I love Valerie's relational question. This is a relationship question. I talk about that as a whole category of questions in that uh, taxonomy of questions video. How do the white things and the round things relate to, relate to each other? Now, I would add um, a little phrase onto that, if at all. Because I'm just playing the devil's advocate here and also just leaving a loophole because I assume based on what I know about this flower um, that those things are supposedly related. Um, however, sometimes, especially, you know, in nature, you, things can be weird. Things can be surprising and um, not being so sure of ourselves all the time is really useful. So how do the white things and the round thing relate to each other? Great question. And let's add the if at all. Ooh, great questions. Jeez, everyone's coming up with some really good questions. Thank you, Cindy, for sharing those. And let's watch this video one more time, and then we're going to go into It Reminds Me Of. And It Reminds Me Of is where you can bring in your knowledge of gardening, your knowledge of... I'm pretty sure these are all Apis mellifera, but like I said, there are plenty of bees that imitate. Um, there's plenty of other organisms that look like bees that are not. So get a quick sketch in if you haven't already, and let's write down, it reminds me of.
Okay, write down at least one weird thing it reminds you of. Ooh, Valerie already beat me to it. Fireworks. What is some weird thing or edible thing that it reminds you of? Get that down before we go to our next um, our next video. I think it's our final video. All right, great. Good job, everybody. Go into the next one. Check this out. And I have no idea what this yellow thing is. All right, sorry it's moving a lot, but let's go ahead and jump into I notice. And it might be easier for you to pretend like you're an alien on this one because what you're looking at is so alien. So let's start off as if we don't know anything about earth, plants, or animals. All we can do is describe shapes, colors, things that we see visually. So what are some things uh, that you see visually uh, right now? Look, I already filled two pages of nature journaling. Things that you notice could include colors, shapes, textures, numbers of things, background, foreground. All right, Valerie and Cindy um, both shared a bunch of cool things that they noticed. Um, multicolored spheres, blackish brown squiggly looking things. Uh, great observations there. It also has a shininess that we saw in other, in other videos and interpreted as wetness. So maybe it's related to that. So let's go ahead and jump into the questions, which a lot of times feels like the most fun part of I Notice, I Wonder, it reminds me of. So um, what are some questions? Start writing down some questions. I'll play the video again. Sorry, it's shaky. Um, it was really small. So now let's pretend like we do. We can bring in some of our assumptions. We don't have to be aliens anymore. Uh, maybe you know about plants. Maybe you know about animals a little bit. Maybe you know about the ocean a little bit. You can bring in some of that information. I'm not noticing very much movement besides the movement of the camera. Maybe I'm not seeing any movement at all. There is something else in this one. Um, See if you can ask. I'm going to pause it here temporarily. I know not everything's in focus, but let's ask some questions. Um, and it's totally fine to start with questions that aren't that interesting and maybe are generic. Those can lead to more interesting questions. They always lead to more interesting questions if you write them down. So 
sometimes doing a little sketch can lead you to questions or observations. Like if you were to try to do a quick sketch of that yellow thing, what would you observe or what would you notice? And the fact that it's blurry right now, that actually could be a bonus and help you draw it and not get fixated on all the details. A lot of times the powerful thing about drawing uh, as a part of nature journaling, it's not about, it's not necessarily about making a page that looks pretty, but it can be about how much more we notice when we draw something. So one strategy is while you're doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of um, while you're doing the, I notice, uh, be drawing it and go back and forth between the drawing and the things that you notice. Let's try asking some location questions. What are some location questions that you could ask about this? What are some relationship questions? What about perspective questions? Is there a question about how you perceive this versus how another organism might perceive this? Or how would this look to um, someone who, how would this, how would this seem, how would this feel and be to someone who didn't have a sense of sight? What would this be like for someone who did not have the sense of sight? Or what's another perspective question? How would someone from another country see this? How would this look in person versus on video? What can't I notice because of it being on video? Those are all perspective questions. So try to ask a perspective question. They're often deeper, a little bit harder to come up with. Um, I probably also used up a bunch of them. If you can't come up with a perspective question, just write down perspective question. Another possible perspective question would be, why can't I think of more perspective questions? Great questions. And this, I was trying to figure out what was going on in this video. Um, this was in the tide pools yesterday morning. Um, I'm actually doing a collaboration with another YouTuber that's going to be coming out soon. And these little things um, that you can see there, there's one here that looks sort of like a sliced open fig. It's near the bottom left. I believe they're a type of sea anemone. And that thing in the beginning of the video that is a sea anemone. Those are all sea anemones too. Ooh, wow. Look at, oh my gosh. So those are sea anemones. You can see in this one, it's a little bit more open. So those purple things on the inside are like those tentacle things that we're used to seeing um, on sea anemones. And they do get all of these rocks and pieces of shell stuck to them as part of their camouflage. Um, but this other one at the beginning of the video seems to have this yellow thing inside of it. And I don't really know, the yellow thing does kind of look like a shrimp of some sort. So I was really curious about that. So let's do, it reminds me of briefly, if you haven't, try to do a quick sketch. It reminds me of can be where you bring in the outside information that you have. So if you know about sea anemones or you just heard from me um, about sea anemones, that's the kind of stuff that you can write down in It Reminds Me Of. It reminds me of a sea anemone. It reminds me of the time Marley poked his toe in a huge sea anemone. It reminds me of um, something I read in a book about blah, blah, blah. It reminds me of a french fry being eaten um, by something from Star Wars or 
whatever. It reminds me of seaweed. It reminds me of um, one of these Vietnamese candies. Um, so anything like that. Um, great question, Cindy. And this is a question I should answer now. I think these were um, uh, smaller, smaller, definitely smaller across than my pinky finger. So quite small. I have a, uh, I think I have a micro lens um, on my phone um, when I took this video. These were pretty small. So that that little um, yellow thing is um, quite a bit shorter than my pinky finger. Okay, this is, so we're going to do a bonus, last bonus video. I said this was the last video, but I'm going to do one more. Um, is it this one? Yeah. So this is the last video. And go ahead and just do, I notice I wonder reminds me of on your own, or whatever you want, just go crazy with this one. Um, I'm not your... Uh, your boss or teacher right now, just nature journal from this video. I'm going to do my own thing. You can do your own thing however you'd want. But the I noticed I wonder it reminds me of that we just went over is the nature journaling basics, the absolute basics to nature journaling. And understanding I notice I wonder it reminds me of is more important than understanding watercolor. I don't care how many watercolor mixing charts you do or how beautiful your flower paintings are. If you don't know how to do I notice I wonder it reminds me of, it's not really nature journaling and nature nature journaling can be even more than what you put down on paper. I notice I wonder it reminds me of shows that nature journaling is a perspective um, and that it can apply to a lot of other things in life and it can make your brain work better. So um, that's why I love I notice I wonder it reminds me of I'm going to do more of these. But right now, let's just take some time on our own to nature journal from this video because this is so cool. Are you blowing bubbles at me? That's not polite dinner table behavior. Are you playing with the bubbles that you're blowing? Are you blowing bubbles at me? That's not polite dinner table behavior. So I'm just doing a really cartoony version of this um, this creature. And uh, I zoomed in where I sort of have this box here pointing to part that I'm interested in. And I wrote blowing bubbles. So this is all I notice. It's a drawing showing what the thing looks like. And it's a little bit of information. So blowing bubbles. Um, and then I could add a question right here. Why is it? Blowing bubbles. Is there a reason? Because remember, it could be a, a byproduct or something that doesn't necessarily have a reason. Is there a reason? And I'll just ask a few more questions next to my drawing. Do all crabs blow bubbles? Do they 
Glow bubbles underwater. And then I'll just connect and I'll do a zoom in and then connect it to and it reminds me of. So I'm zooming in on the eye and it reminds me of a goat eye. So look at that. I got all pretty much all of the, what I do need to do would be to do to add a little bit of numbers here. So like if I said, how many legs does it have? I think it has one, two, three, four, four legs on this side four legs, a one pincher, and four legs, one pincher. So that is nature journaling. How easy was that? It took me um, less than five minutes to nature journal that. And um, I have, I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of, I have a zoomed in part of the drawing, a really simple cartoonish almost um, drawing here, but this is basically how easy nature journaling can be. And I'm covering the basics. If I had just spent 30 minutes trying to paint a perfect um, or do a perfect kind of colored pencil drawing of this photo, that can be beautiful. That could be absolutely beautiful art but it's not nature journaling, just painting a realistic depiction of this shiny crab in the seaweed is art, but it's not nature journaling. So asking questions, uh, making a distinction between what you observe and what your interpretations are, um, asking questions, using words, numbers, and images, all of this makes it into nature journaling. And to, in my opinion, these are more powerful uh, much more powerful than just being able to do an amazing painting of that crab over there. That's cool if you can do that, but you can also take a photo of it. But can you do this? And how does this affect your brain? That is what I'm interested in. So thanks for everybody who joined in and participated. Cindy and Valerie most recently have been participating awesomely in the chat. Thank you so much um, for joining in for today's session. Rose was here earlier. Jean was here. Um, who else was here? Angie was here. Um, thank you for all of the people who jo joined in on the chat, many of whom are actually patrons on my Patreon. So that means that they get access to some videos that never come out on YouTube or Facebook. And for as little as $1 a month, they are helping make the Nature Journal show possible because 99.9% .9 of what I do is free and is available for the nature journaling community and is just trying to spread nature journaling to more people and help you do it better and help you get even more out of your nature journaling. So with videos about products, videos about techniques, um, videos where I take you along for nature journaling adventures, all of those come out on the nature journal show and some of these amazing people whose names I just mentioned our patrons on my Patreon, and we're going to have some like cool items and merchandise such as stickers coming out pretty soon. But for now, it's mostly about these educational videos for all of you. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you get a chance, I know it's almost the end of the weekend for a lot of people, but if you get a chance to go outside and nature journal or nature journal in your house, something within the next 24 hours, do it because nature journaling is good for your brain and try to use some of those techniques that we just practiced today. And if you can't wait all the way until next week for the next episode of the show, watch one of the other videos that I have in my playlist. I have several about questions, how to get started with nature journaling, all of those things. All right. Thanks everybody for joining in and bye Jean, bye Valerie, bye Cindy. Have a good one.